What is up, everybody? Welcome to The Stack. I'm Alex. I'm Justin. I'm Pete. And on The Stack, we talk about a bunch of comics that have come out this very we week. Do? We do? We do. I know surprise, that's a huge surprise. surprise. That's exciting. Yeah. That's we, great news. Yeah. I mean, you've been, you got prepped on all these old comics, Pete, but we're going to talk yeah. about new comics. Oh. Yeah, you thought we were talking about um, comedians that came out this week. Uh, with uh, <laughs> jokes, but no, we're talking about comic books. Yeah, all right, mm-hmm. but we're going to start it off with Jerry Seinfeld driving around with Larry David, <laughs> getting a nice cup of Java. What'd what a cliffhanger! <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, we're going to kick it off Love with the Ma- splash page. Maestro, number one from Marvel Comics, written by Peter David and art by Jermaine wow, Peralta. You know, uh, totally coincidentally, I talked about this a little bit on the live show, but Future Imperfect, of course, is one of the best Hulk stories of all time. It's where we were introduced to the maestro, the evil future version of the Hulk. And here, finally, after decades, Peter Peter David is going back and giving us the origin of this Hulk. Um, I'll tell you, as a fan of that story, I didn't know what to expect going in here. I was pretty nervous. But as usual, Peter David delivers a really good, really interesting story. It goes in some weird directions. And even with the enormous amount of post-apocalypse stuff that not only Marvel has done, but we've seen uh, all over of late, I think this really stands on its own. What was your take? Uh, I was just so happy to get, like, not horrific Hulk. So this was just really cool. This is the most horrific Hulk. Well, yeah, but it's not like oh, I morphed evil, okay. like horror story Hulk. Yeah, um, you you like that he still has like abs in this. Yeah, he still looks like the Hulk. And the he doesn't abs look don't like... have little eyeballs that say, hello, Pete. Yeah. Hello, uh, uh, don't you wish you had me? <laughs> um, yeah, I thought this was great. Very cool start to what I hope is going to be kind of like an epic Hulk story. Um, yeah, I, I think the art's amazing. Does a great job of grabbing the reader, getting you into a kind of interesting story. Uh, yeah, I'm very excited to see how this pans out. Um, yeah, I agree. I love the art uh, on this. Like, really great stuff. Uh, it was Hulk. nice to see uh, Dale Keown coming in and doing some yeah. stuff. Uh, famed Hulk artist. Yeah, um, plus you're in Hollywood right now, which yeah. is now just called Hulk. Yeah, no, and people have noticed here. Um, obviously, yeah, uh, we're in a full uh, post-apocalypse out here, um, and people love the sign. People are climbing up on it, getting their pictures. Like, can you believe this sign changed? Um, I also want to say about this, it is a great story. It, there's a little bit of that sort of like, uh, almost like end of Planet of the Apes vibe to it, where it's like, you did it, you you people, you did it, <laughs> you did it, uh, which I'm like, okay. But the, a lot of the ideas are really fun, um, and I'm curious to watch the Hulk sort of descend into this mm-hmm. uh, disaster. It almost feels like, even though they're different post-apocalyptic futures, it definitely feels of a piece with Old Man Wolverine to me. Um, and I'm curious to see... I don't think Peter David in any way is going to go in the same direction that Mark Millar did, because Mark Millar is always like, I'm going to shock you with my ridiculous ideas. And Peter David's more about leading towards a quip or coming up with a character moment or something like that. Um, Yeah. But there's definitely a temptation there, particularly as we head closer and closer to that future and perfect timeline. When do you think the Hulk will pop his claws? Like right at the end? Oh, man, that's going to be great. What a great moment. Peter, you looking forward to that? (laughs) Snick. (laughs) <laughs> oh, what? That's the thing about that. It makes me think of Old Man Logan, where it's like, they're like, what's fun about this character? His claws. Okay, let's not let him do that until later. And the audience will go crazy for it. <laughs> and it fucking worked. Fuck you. But, dude, the, the great part about that story is that post apocalyptic, like seeing them ride around in that spider buggy av- all across the country and like. Where how things have kind of turned into it, it's very creative and cool. It was. Also, I couldn't. I don't know where they got the idea to have sort of this place that's like, he's like sort of past the Thunderdome, like beyond the Thunderdome. I guess oh, where you weird. have like funny cars they're driving around in. It's crazy. It's so original. Fuck you, man! It's a great story, and also someone jumps out of his stomach. 
That's great. It'd be like if Mark if Mark Miller was writing this episode, it'd be if he, he was like, okay, Pete says fuck you to Justin a lot. What if we <laughs> waited until the very end for him to say it? And I'll tell you what, I'd appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> Let's move on with our next book, Voyage to the Stars, number one from IDW, story by Ryan Coppel and James Asmus, art by Connie Dedon. Uh, this is based on a podcast, apparently, uh, which I did not realize at first, uh, but then very quickly realized when we got to the title page, it was calling out Felicia Day and Janet Varney and a couple of other folks who clearly also have been in, the in the comic. They talk about the podcast. They like also talk the about comic. a podcast in there. Yeah. And I yeah. couldn't help but wonder where's our comic book. And that's my review of Voyage to the Stars. Number one. Wow. What a great niche to carve out is a, a readership of all podcasters saying, hey, what the what what I I could be the comic. <laughs> um, I think our comic is the truck. Where's my serial comic, comic book? I want my serial <laughs> comic book. Sorry, Pete. Yeah, I I, I was just doing a truck nuts joke. You know, <laughs> I don't know what that means. Yes, there are some robot nuts. Yeah, the robot oh, right. nuts okay. are a, a play uh, on people's trucks or cars. They put fake nuts and they call them truck yeah. nuts. And this, it's mech nuts, you know. Mm-hmm. Makes sense. Whenever I get in a, an Uber or taxi, I always make sure to affix my, my portable truck nuts to the bottom of the car. <laughs> Take Smart. the car to wherever I'm going, pull them very back you off, should, and put uh, them in this, the satchel I carry with my me. My wife and I, we use a service. We pay 50 bucks a month uh, called Zip Nuts, and you can rent a car, and they put the nuts on the car for you, which is nice. very nice. <laughs> I just want to say, in case people aren't wondering, Justin is classy. He keeps his nuts in a Crown Royale bag. It's velvet. It's very important. <laughs> it's true. It's true. Nothing says classy like taking a liquor bag and putting other stuff in it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that all said, as usual, James Asmus is good with the bits. And I think knowing nothing about this podcast, you still get the sense that it's this ridiculous space journey parody thing. I think the bits are fun throughout. There's couple of things yeah. that made me laugh out loud. Um, it's enjoyable. Like, if, you, if you're looking for a silly space adventure, this is a fun thing to check out. Plus, the art's really great. Now, Justin, as somebody who's been on Mission to Zix, which, as I understand it, is another space-themed podcast, did you get really angry about this? Well, this is a, a, a rival podcast to Mission to Zix, and they definitely have some... Um, Star maybe- power? Some well, yes, um, and maybe some uh, competitive feelings with this podcast. Um, so I did read that, and I was like, "Oh shit, this is that other podcast." So I'm definitely a Zix guy till I die, and I hope they have a comic book coming Zix soon. Zix guy till I die. <laughs> Uh, All right, next up, here's what I'm sure you're in favor of. Justin Lowe, number 24 from Image Comics, written by Rick Remender and uh, art by Greg Tacchini. Man, we are coming very close to the end here. Justin, uh, you've got to check out this Lowe book because you haven't talked about it at all. And I'm interested to see if you would like something like this because it's a little different. Yeah. Uh, When they go high, I go low to read this great book. Um I I love this book, and I'll tell you what, I don't know how it happened, but Rick Remender got me again. The first half <laughs> of this book is like, oh, shit, I think they're going to pull this off. I think it's like coming together, everything, the family's re- reunited. Let me just back up and describe the story. It takes place um, in a post-apocalyptic Earth. Uh, society has moved deep underwater because the environment went to hell. This right, family right. Um, that was pretty happy in like issue one for like three pages uh, gets torn <laughs> apart. Uh, the father is killed. I would killed. say three panels. There may be three panels. Um, and the whole series has been following them on their separate equally horrifying journeys. Um, and then slowly over the last like maybe ten issues um, the mother um, found a uh, found a way to save humanity. She found a relationship. Um, they escaped their captors. Uh, the sisters were reunited. They sort of didn't, there's some issues between them, but they, they were all working together. And then the first half of this issue was like, hope is re- a new. And then it's, I don't want to spoil what happens, but it's a living nightmare. By the end. <laughs> <laughs> and I was fooled. I was fooled by Rick Remender, who never fails to do this. And it's he amazing how he, does it. he, he, he still fooled me. And that's good writing. Yeah. It's also the art is bananas good. Yeah, it's great. There's some huge uh, splash pages and action moments throughout here, as well as, of course, the family stuff that happens. 
I don't know how this is going to end at this point. I don't know what is going to happen. Um, I'm curious. This is a book that I really want to go back and read again after it's done because there's been so much space between issues. I feel like I forget what's going on or who the characters are, what their motivations are, particularly because they've gotten so far afield from where they started. Um, But good stuff. Let's move on to another post-apocalyptic book. Wonder Woman, Dead Earth, number four from DC Comics. Story and art by Daniel Warren Johnson. This is the final issue of this book, which finds Wonder Woman... Spoiler, in the last issue, turns out has destroyed the Earth. It was her fault that everything went wrong. This issue, she goes about setting it right, uh, whipping people with, I believe, the spinal column of Batman? Or is it Superman? I believe Uh, Superman, but yeah. Superman. Superman. Yeah, uh, Superman's spine and his skull, uh, which is pretty gruesome. I mean, if you're going to whip someone with a spine, great spine to do it with. Yeah, I mean, a strong spine. Yeah. Because imagine after the yellow sun rays hit that spine, it gets even stronger. Yeah. Mm. Oh, that's a nice spine, is what I always say. Oh, my yeah. God. Uh, and there, I mean, if you want to talk about, like, art and splash pages, there oh, yeah. is a double-page spread when you flip the page of all the monsters they're fighting that made me, like, giggle out loud. It was so good. Uh, this issue is great. So good. And yeah. I do think, it, it, did it, was there a Flash Gordon homage in this book? Uh, very, yeah. um, I think Wonder Woman is, uh, dives, and I think in the uh, sort of a hidden image is the word dive, like the famous uh, th- moment in Flash Gordon where the guy yells, Dive! <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Is that, is that a, maybe that's a very maybe. arch, weird thing that I uh, made up in my brain, but I think it's there. Yeah. Pete, what did you think about this book? You're a big fan. Uh, yeah, I mean, just from the start, uh, I, I, it was such a cool idea. Um, it was interesting to see Wonder Woman at such a tough place when this book started to where she ends up. And there's still like a not everything's great, but it's it's a good ending. And I, I yeah, it's just cool. It was a great take on Wonder Woman, like the way she was drawn, uh, just uh, and it ended so well. It, it really stuck the landing. I was worried about it, but this was such a great issue. Uh, Danny Warren Johnson, he writes with heart. There's a lot of love behind what he's doing, even though there's a lot of gore and violence. And it's really, really uh, uh, just fantastic, the art and writing, the combination together. The splash pages, the storytelling, it's, he, it's just phenomenal. This is a great thing to buy as a collection and put on your shelf. Because it's uh, an excellent piece. I agree. Yeah. Uh, next up, from one of Pete's favorite books to one of Pete's least favorite books, Faithless, number two, number three. <laughs> Faithless, two, number three, excuse me, from Boob Studios. Written by Brian Azzarello and art by Maria Lovett. Uh, I feel like my... Uh, love auto- it, yeah. You love it, yeah. My autocorrect did something weird there. Um, so this book... <laughs> Our main characters have gone to Italy, I believe, and yes. are hanging out in the art world. When we left in the last issue, our main character was being attacked by a swarm of flies. That mm-hmm. kind of plays throughout this issue. This is a mix of sex and blood and magic, and it's disturbing on every page. I know we talk about basically the same thing every issue, but real Arvitz art, great. The tone of this issue in particular is so alarming throughout like our main character faith has gotten in way over her head once again and horrible things are happening to her at every end there's just dread suffused at every page man i love reading this book i understand why you don't like it pete uh, but i think it is so good pete i love reading your face as you review it so give me a quick give me a quick little hit uh of what you thought because the story and art of your face reviewing this book is excellent. It's w- worth it for the uh, the art alone. Oh, thanks, man. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the art is fantastic. It's almost like a kind of a watercolor kind of feel to it, which I, I'm always a sucker for. Um, but, yeah, it's just catty people doing catty things and... Bunch you know, of catty daddies. By, by oh, catty right. things, you mean fucking, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, they're, yeah, they're just, uh, just uh, whatever, you know. Um, 
you know, playing with people's emotions and, you know, whatever, high society bullshit. And, you know, and then there's this girl who we hope ends up being a good person, but who the fuck knows? Um, Art's great. Brian Azzarello is an amazing writer. I love his work. But, you know, this is just kind of some pervy fun. So if you're into that kind of stuff, (laughs) go at it. (laughs) Wow. Uh, great. Your review didn't disappoint. Um, I like this book. Um, I will say it feels like this second arc. I'm ready for it to kick into gear a little bit. It yeah. feels like it's it's been a little bit of like, oh, shit's really weird. And then um, there's sex and some like intimidating uh, presence that turns out to be a dream. So I'm ready to get to that next sort of flashpoint where the story can really uh, move from there but I, it just as a mood as a, a vibe this book is really interesting it feels like uh, like a late 80s early 90s movie that's sort of feeling almost like the Fisher King or something like that um, oh wow Really like it wasn't this much sex in the Fisher King what bro. was the one with uh, Robert De Niro like devil's something not devil's advocate Ad- not devil's advocate I was in that movie, by the way, but that's unimportant. Wait, uh, I'm sorry. What? Wait, hold up. Wow. Yeah. Who who'd you play? Uh, you- I was. So I I almost was reporter chasing after Keanu Reeves until they found out I wasn't Union. Uh, specifically, an actor turned to me. It was like, "Are you Union?" And I was like, "No, I'm not Union." And they were like, "Well, get out of here." And I was like, "All right, I'm sorry, but uh, 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 you can see my blurry forehead in one of the courtroom scenes." What? Yo, you should, should have lied. Have, I sh- I should have lied, but too bad, too bad. Uh, no, it's not Devil's Advocate. I don't remember the name of the movie. Anyway, it reminds me of that. But let's move on. Uh, talk about one of my favorite <laughs> books of the week, and I am so surprised it is. G.I. Joe number 7 from IDW, written by Paul Allure and art by Chris Avenhuis. Uh So we talked about the last issue of this book. This is the G.I. Joe book that feels very modern, both in the coloring and the art and the tone of it. It's taking a more realistic version of war versus some of the other G.I. Joe books we've talked about. Uh, And this issue is so good. Uh, Pete, you're going to have to help me on the character names. I think it's Scarlet and Duke are the ones that are focused on, right? Yeah. Okay. That is correct. So in this continuity, G.I. Joe has basically, excuse me, Cobra has basically taken over America, and we follow Scarlet as she is recovering from PTSD from the first front of the war, and as Cobra slowly takes over America, and she's recovering in the background, as Duke checks in with her every now and again, being like, we really need your help. We need your help from G.I. Joe. Please, we need your help. And it is an amazingly structured view of PTSD through these G.I. Joe characters with some incredible art and pacing. This is like, and I say this complimentarily, not to, you know, just throw in another uh, writer here, but it feels like if Tom King was writing G.I. Joe to me, you know, like it's, I, I was so impressed. Yeah, I agree, man. What a great story, great book dealing with like really, really in strong, like intense themes, but in a way that doesn't, it still feels like they're leading up to some G.I. Joe action. The art reminds me of uh, Morning Glories, if you remember that series Mm -hmm. uh, from back uh, in the day. Yeah, it's really, I agree with everything you're saying, Alex. And Pete, as the G.I. Joe head uh, here, what did you think? Well, I'm trying to look up this fucking Robert De Niro. Uh, are you talking about Angel Heart? Angel Heart, yes. Jesus Christ, man. I said devil. It's close. That's not close. I've never heard of that movie. Oh, oh it's like God. a sexy fuck movie with some magic and some blood and some sex. It's exactly right. That's oh a perfect God. movie for you, sir. Uh, <laughs> all right, yeah, it. this... I saw it in video stores a lot, and I was like, wow, Robert De Niro is very large on that cover. But I never saw (laughs) it. Yeah, this is a very, very interesting book. It's crazy because you don't really have a lot of the G.I. Joe action that G.I. Joe is known for. But I really appreciate what they're doing in this book. And uh, I didn't think I would like it as much as I did. And I was really moved by it. And it's really cool. Yeah, great book. Definitely pick it up. Next one. The art is awesome as well. The art's great. It's worth it for the art alone, I would say. Oh, weird. 
Avengers number 35 from Marvel Comics by Jason Aaron and Javier Garon. Uh, this is continuing the Fist of Conchu storyline where Moon Knight has stolen everybody's powers ostensibly to stop Mephisto. And this issue is going after the star brand, among other things. Uh, this every. Every single thing in this book is so insanely over the yeah. top. It's yes. so fun to read. The, most of the book, I don't even, not even most of the book, but like part of the book is taken up with some of the remaining adventures being like, we're going to attack a train full of mummies. And yeah. that's only a small part of the book. It's wild and great and of a blast to read. Yeah, Iron Man is so being so weird in this book. He's being like really chatty and really like he's like running at the mouth in a weird way. I, I I thought it was so so interesting. I feel like Jason Aaron's been running this little pocket universe um, with this Avengers book, where like it feels a lot like Scott Snyder's uh, stuff in the DC universe, where it's just like a ton of ideas. Mephisto has um, Hellfire guns. Like everyone's doing something crazy, um, but it's really working and. Uh, I like setting up Mephisto as a bigger bad in the Marvel Universe as well, um, as well as uh, Khonshu and Moon Knight in general. So this is like a fun direction to be going in. Yeah, this is just over the top fun. And I agree with him. He, you know, I, I don't think I would tire from killing Mephisto. But even after a while, it kind of uh, I was like, all right, yeah, I agree with you. It's getting old. But fantastic last page. I'm very excited to see where this goes. Yeah, it's weird. It's Iron Man's like three men and a baby all of a sudden. I don't understand what's happening. But like, it's a, the main. That's the baby star fa- brand. I did oh, love. There's a great uh, bit of dialogue that happens back and forth between Iron Man and Captain Marvel in this book, where they have a reveal where it's Iron Man and Captain Marvel fi- fighting. You only see them from the shoulders up, and then it pulls back, and Iron Man's like, "And also, I have this baby. What is going yeah. on here? Yeah. What are?" And there's a line like, "What are we, the X Men now? What is going on?" I know, it's so funny, so funny. Uh, great. Uh, just this whole book is just, again, such a blast to read. Let's move on to A Man Among Ye, number two, from Top Cow Image Comics, written by Stephanie Phillips, an art by Craig Surmack. I think we were pretty complimentary of this first issue, but we're curious to check out the second one, which is why we threw it in the stack here. In the first issue, we followed a uh, pirate named Annie and Bonnie, uh, who is protected by her boyfriend, Jack, who is the captain of the ship. We discovered that there was a stowaway who was also a secret girl, and that's where he left off with Anne protecting her. That's where we pick up this issue as they form a bit of an alliance uh, and uh, figure each other out. I did, personally, I like this issue um, much better. I think the story is going in some really fun directions, and the art continues to be great in this book. Yeah, this is a great uh, a surprise that I've now really looking forward to. I thought the first issue was great setting this up, Good art, fun storytelling. Like it was wasn't like oh my god, you gotta check this out. But I was like okay, I see what you're doing here. But the second issue really hits hard and gets the story moving in such a great direction. Gets you really excited for this team up and this adventure. And I think this is going to be really cool. I, I like it. Quick thinking with the um, instant puke moment. Really mm-hmm. gotta you gotta know when to do that and know when to hold back from doing that. Yes. Uh, Don't just stick your fingers down somebody's throat just because you think they're poison. You got to know they're poison. Exactly. Yeah. You don't want to just yeah. be out on a date or at a restaurant and be like, were you poisoned? Just if they uh, start to you know act a little weird. Um, but I agree. I like this book. Uh, it's I think the premise has, is set at the end of this issue in yes. a way that I'm like, excellent. Great. Yeah, it definitely, I am more, without getting too much into boat puns, I'm more on board with this issue, but like you said, with the end of this issue, it feels like, okay, now we're getting to what this book is, uh, and it will, it's going to be a fun ride going forward, I think. I guess you could say, since we all liked it, we're all aboard for this. (laughs) Oh boy, come on. Full steam Uh, ahead. Well, I'll tell you, I wasn't bored. Uh, (laughs) Does that work? Does that work? I don't think so. You mean a board because ships are made of boards? Uh, I'm not 100% sure. Next up, Rye, number six from Valiant Comics, written by Dan Abnett and art by Juan Jose Rip. So this is a new arc for Rye. Everything 
from his big old world has fallen to Earth and is left there. In this issue, we get a bunch of Roman centurions from a Roman pleasure part of the world that he encounters. They want his help to fight father, the overbearing God who controlled his life. Uh, and he's like, no, I don't want to do it. Um, and we get a couple of other teases throughout. Uh, uh, go ahead, Pete. I was just going to say, this is just classic, you know, humanity. A God comes down, saves your ass. And it's just not enough. You know, we want you to stay. We want you to keep saving us. Put your life Wait, on hold. You're for taking us. the God side on this one. Yeah, because like, hey, he saved you, man. You didn't die in this war that you clearly were going to lose to fucking giant bear animals. He saves your ass, and then you're all crying about it because he's going to leave. He's got shit to do, all right? He can't put his life on hold for you. Wow. Okay. Strong take Uh, from Pete. Pete, the god, the god buddy Pete. God friend Pete. What'd you think about it, Justin? Yeah, what's Uh, your point? (laughs) Um, I think this is great. Of of all the books we're talking about this week, um, this feels like it would be a great animated series. Mm. Um, Mm Mm-hmm. It, ha- it has that uh, – you have your uh, hero and the sort of sidekick in uh, Rage In. Um, and interesting story. It feels like it's uh, almost a um, – what's the name of the HBO robot series that is West mostly World. bad? It's like Westworld style world, <laughs> a fallen world where there are a lot of robots and everyone's like mad all the time. Um, it feels like uh, that. And it's good. Yeah. Uh, so, to- wait, wait. I just want to get back to this for a second, Justin. You think this god has a responsibility to stay and help this fucking group of people forever? Um, I'm not saying uh, I'm not saying that. I'm, uh, I, I think it's weird to take the side. You don't seem concerned with what the heroes of the story are doing. doing. You're like, the god got a raw deal. God needs to chill and he needs a vacation day. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying, like, they're asking too much of him. He already saved them. You know what I mean? Like, how many times has he got to keep doing that? Were you a god somewhere, and then you got burnt by having too much homework? Uh, uh, Pete, uh, did you just say no? (laughs) If somebody asks you if you're a god, what do you say? You you say yes. There you go. Uh, wow. Two things I wanted to call about this Good issue one. in particular. I love Ghostbusters trap. <laughs> uh, Bustin makes me feel good. Uh, Bustin I love, made me feel good. I not love, good. Tell him about the Twinkie. <laughs> Juan Jose Rip is one of my favorite artists. I love his work. Uh, and in particular, this is very reminiscent of Britannia, which was an awesome series that came oh, out from yeah. Valiant uh, that he was the artist on, and that was all about Roman centurions set in the Valiant universe. So for a brief time, I was like, am I reading the wrong book? What is happening here? Wow. So that was great. Uh, that was a fun surprise. And then there's a moment later on where somebody, and I'm not 100% sure which character this is, uh, is looking at computer screen and sees Rye come up and it goes, Rye, 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 and it changes into Ray. And she's like, wait, who's Ray? And then Bloodshot's face come up and he's like, help yeah. Ray. And I was like, Jesus Christ, finally, they are getting to these two weird pale dudes that look exactly the same, but are 3000 years apart that have very similar names and hopefully going to explain what's going on there, which I was very happy to see we were getting towards. Um, So that was a nice moment as well. Um, Yeah. But uh, good book. Uh, Next up, Batman number 97 from DC Comics, written by James Time of the Fourth, art by Jorge Jimenez. Pete, you want to talk about this one? You seem pretty psyched. This is just just insane. This is just a crazy book. Um, I'm really impressed with what they're doing with this whole Joker war and how this is all going down. And I'm also very excited for like the fights that are gearing up, like the Harley Quinn punchline showdown that's coming. Uh, yeah, I, it's basically Batman kind of, uh, is struggling to kind of catch up to what's going on. And then Harley Quinn (laughs) doses him and gets him all drugged up and leaves him. So this is very interesting, cool book. Uh, The art's phenomenal. And uh, yeah, it's just action packed. What'd you think about this one, Justin? I liked it as well. I mean, 
James uh, Tynan is doing such a good job of making Batman feel like he really doesn't have a great plan and has no idea what's happening. Something that is hard to do because so often it's about Batman feigning ignorance and then revealing a plan. And the way it's written, it really feels like he doesn't know what's happening. Harley Quinn knows more about it than he does. And uh, we're setting up this Harley and Batman versus Joker and Punchline, which is a fun dynamic uh, to go into battle with. Yeah. A couple of things that I thought were kind of interesting about this. First of all, this is the first time they were explicit about the fact that Joker knows exactly who Batman is and that he's Bruce Wayne, which I was surprised about, but appreciated the fact that it was a relatively underplayed moment, that it was just something that was part and parcel with it, which is interesting. It definitely throws me because I don't love the idea of Joker knowing who he is, but... That's already been established, so moving forward from there is fine. The other thing uh, that I really liked was Joker talking about their back and forth and saying, oh, this is just part of explaining to Punchline, this is part of the game, is I made my move, he makes his move, then I make my move, but we go one at a time. We go back and forth. That's how it works. That all said... There's something that I believe Harley says where he's like, she's like, this is not his MO at all. Something is weird here. So do you feel like, is there a twist coming? Is there something happening with Joker that we don't know about? Well, if things continue as they have started as yes, because like, as this book has kind of been unfolding, it has been this thing of like, oh, you think this is what happening, but Joker's had this secret plan this whole time. Oh, you think this is where it is, but... So I wouldn't be surprised, and it would be cool if it kind of kept going that way. I do think there's a twist coming, um, but I think it's crazy. It's a crazy statement for Harley Quinn to make because Joker is simultaneously <laughs> a random street tough that has got dipped in a chemical vat, is an ancient evil that takes the form of jo- Joker <laughs> and emerged from underneath Gotham City. Um, it's just a million things. So to be like, this seems weird for this figure that no one understands yeah. uh, <laughs> is a little much. Um, but uh, yeah, so, but the but way she that would know, she would know she dated him briefly. Yeah. I wouldn't say, I would say it was more than brief. Hmm. Well, well, she's no punchline. I feel oh, like that's a easy. thing though. Like when you, when you find out that your ex is dating someone new and you're like, this is out of character for that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. You know how they're dating not me? That seems there's they're off. Uh I also like the clown hunter um story that's sort of Yeah, I'm excited now. for this. That Who is, is who's cool. clown hunter? Just some we guy. All are. Yeah, random. No some no random. Un- unknown. <laughs> Young Alfred, it's Alfred's son. Oh, what do you think wow. about the last page, Pete? Oh, I, I'm hoping it. Oh, I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen. Alfred's dead, though. Alfred's dead. Yeah, Let's they snapped that. his neck, and he's dead. He's super he's, dead. Yeah. Like not like his. The buttling is over. Yeah, stop. There's going to be a line next issue where Batman's like, "Well, at least the baggots are eating his eyes." Oh, come on, man. <laughs> Speaking of back, it's eating people's eyes. Once in Future, number 10, from Boom Studios, written by Kieran Gillen and illustrated by Dan Moore. This is continuing the arc where Beowulf is dead and Grendel has come to take his place. He is attacking our main characters. He, yeah, he, I guess. Grendel's mother is the she in that story. Uh, and uh, things go wild and crazy and horrible and bloody as Grendel attacks a nursing home. Pete, you love this book as well. Were you happy with this issue? Yes, and also strange twist, but Hot Fuzz reference in the middle of this book. Could not believe it. They get lit uh, up pretty hard. It's a- dude, like Simon Pegg, straight up right out of the Hot Fuzz movie. Could not believe that reference. Um, but yeah, this is this is a continues to be an unbelievable book. Um, and I just also love the whole thing about, like, a uh, grandmother not answering her cell phone when you want her to. Uh, there's nothing more frustrating when you're trying to get an older person who doesn't look at their goddamn phone. Uh, but, yeah. Uh, I, I, the That's arts- what I feel like when I'm trying to get a hold of you, Pete. 
Oh, thanks, man. Fuck you. I'm not your grandma. Um, Again, but- wait till the end to say fuck you to me, like Wolverine's claws. <laughs> um, I will never wait to say fuck you. It's one of my favorite things to do. Uh, but the art is worth it alone. This is just unbelievable storytelling, art and writing, working as one. It's just, I want this to live on forever. Um, I like this book, too. It, it really... It's great and everything everyone's saying, um, but the way the amount of story you get each issue is just really well done. It feels like an episode of TV, each book, in a smart way, where there's an arc, there's some action, there's a great cliffhanger. Um, It's all about satisfying the end of these stories, these canonical stories, which I think is a a fun thing to follow, very Sandman-esque. It's good. Good stuff. Next up, Lords of Empire. But you, you guys knew it was Hot Fuzz and Simon Pegg, right? Like, you guys got that, right? No, I yes. totally missed it, actually. Oh, for wow. real? Sorry, I read it pretty quickly, but I like the book. Okay. All right. Wow. <laughs> Lords of Empire, Swordsman number one from Marvel, written by Alex Packnadel and art by Thomas Natchlik. This is continuing these one shots, focusing on the big players in Empire. Here we get Swordsman, who is Kath Katati half swordsman at this point, and we get a little bit of his backstory and origin. Um, I like this issue a lot. I like this better than the Celestial Madonna or whatever the name is. Messiah. Uh, Messiah, thank you. Uh, One that happened before this. Um, I thought it was a solid story. There was some good emotion to it, and it certainly explained the swordsman's motivation, which is a weird character to understand in this book. Did you get the Shaun of the Dead reference throughout? <laughs> no, I'm, I nice. read it very quickly, so I missed it. <laughs> oh, that was hilarious. Um, yeah, I agree with you. I think um, this was a, a fun, a fun book. These lords, this Empire event, and these standalone issues are super weird. They're super interesting. The pieces of the story they're telling and giving you a backstory on a on swordsman, and it's not even the actual swordsman. It's like the ghost of swordsman living in this tree man um, is. Not an essential story, one would think, in a normal event. So, But it was fun to read. Uh, the environmental undertones, this whole thing could have been stopped if people didn't chop down these trees. Um, I love when Swordsman just lays down and is like, I'm going to be a tree from here on out. I'm jealous. I'd love uh, to be a tree. Yeah, I mean, uh, it was hard Dogs to... Dogs un- peeing on you? Be great. Uh, the life. Uh, um, it was hard to uncross my arms to read this one. Uh uh, Swordsman is not a great character. I'm not interested, really. Why you love both of those nouns in his name? Yeah, that's true. Uh, but I wait. I have know, a question about the uncrossing the arms thing. Did you yeah. read the comic book behind you and kind of like flip the pages like this and look over your shoulder when you're doing it, or what was the deal? No, no. I I'm talking about it as a metaphor. Like, okay, please. Make oh, me you ca- weren't physically crossing your arms? I was mentally crossing my arms, okay. saying, okay, I make, me, I make me care about the swordsman, and you didn't. So, I, great art. <laughs> <laughs> I, Pete, great. I gotta say, I think your arms are still mentally crossed. Hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Well, let's move on to another one then. Power Rangers Dracon New Dawn, number one from Boob Studios, written by Anthony Birch and illustrated by Simone Regazzoni. We talked about the last Power Rangers book, which also took place in this post-apocalyptic side reality or something like that. I don't really understand Power Rangers stuff. Uh, But that seemed like the end of the storyline. Turns out this is actually picking up on it. As uh, the a, a ranger slayer has taken over mm-hmm. for Dracon and is yes. now ruling and has to figure out how to rule properly. Um, I was, uh, I think you guys liked the last issue a lot more than I did. I like this issue a lot more. This feel felt interesting to me in yeah, terms this... of the direction it goes. Uh, what what was your take? I thought this was fun. Uh, I thought this was a cool take. Uh, I, I agree with you. I, I like this one a little bit better. It's real cool art, fun storytelling. Go, go Power Rangers, man. This is this is interesting stuff. Yeah, go, go Power Rangers. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's the ticket. Um, I feel like they did. They do a good job in the in the last issue and in this one of creating this sort of mythology around um, a 
uh, a, a live action show for kids that didn't put a lot of time in creating a mythology. Um, so it, I like that aspect of it. I like the mystery here of who this uh, additional character is, probably a Power Ranger. Um, it does make me wonder, do you think, do you feel like it's such a trend now to take these sort of old uh, properties and develop a big world around them? What's a show or something we watched when we were young that you don't think could have that done to it? That we don't think could be developed into a, a like deeper, doesn't larger... doesn't have the depth there? Yeah. Because, like, Power Rangers, uh, sort of a stretch, I feel like. There was... You know, there was something happening there, but the show never was like, well, here's why there are Power Rangers, and here's the deal with Rita Repulsa. Mm. Mm. Good question. Saved know, by the bell. Ha. Interesting. Well, Except they're, they're do- doing that. They're yeah, doing, they're it's doing coming, that. They just released a trailer. It's coming out soon. Yeah, Peacock. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, the first thing I thought of was like Mask, but I would love to see that. Oh, mask would be great. Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, not to also. Oh, go ahead. Oh, all I was going to say is not to avoid your question. Like it is a good question, and I'm sure we could come up with some very funny answers. But like the, fa- <laughs> the fact you, of the matter is, you're giving you away can, the game, Alex. You can take anything and spin a good story about it with the right idea. You know, like you just have to look at the bare bones. Like, well, here's here's my answer. Um, yeah. I used to watch, um, I think, my sophomore year of college. There was a block in the afternoon when I would come home from class, uh, and we would watch The Mystic Knights of Tirna Nog, which was a Power Rangers ripoff. Sure. And then right after that was The Nanny. And I don't think they could do The Nanny and develop a deeper mythology around it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think they could. You just got to get the right writer on it. Interesting. What do you think that's, that world would be, that larger mythological Where world? does she get her nanny powers from? That's what I want to know. I believe Flushing, if I remember the theme song correctly. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> okay. Well, where is that? What is that world like? Oh, interesting. Flushing, toilets, a toilet world. There's a whole world in your toilet. Yeah, like it's a piece of shit. World. Like it's a oh. shitty idea. <laughs> Uh, well, anyway, this comic is good. Moving on to another uh, adapted property, Star Trek Deep Space Nine, Too Long, A Sacrifice, number two from IDW, written by Scott Tipton and David Tipton, art by Greg Scott. Uh, we talked about the last issue of this one as well. This is a we sure did. Uh, mystery set on Deep Space Nine. Uh, you guys liked it quite a bit. How'd you feel about this issue? I mean, this series does a great job of really bringing the voices from the show to life in the comic. Like, just everything about it feels like a true episode of Deep Space Nine, and that's good. To the down to the point where there's not there's a scene where they're like, "Hey, let's go fuck around and really threaten these guys," and then they do almost nothing, just like they would on any Star Trek show because there's never violence in Star Trek world. Um, so kudos to that. And it, yeah, it's a fun mystery. It feels like it's really living up to the title. Um, if you don't watch Deep Space Nine, I feel like you'd be like, what is this? Uh, but other than that, good. Yeah, I wasn't a, a big watcher, so I'm kind of coming from that perspective, but I know the characters well enough. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I think it's a fun kind of like who done it kind of Star Trek type thing. Um, yeah, and it's interesting because it's like in this issue we get something solved and then kind of like a new problem brought back around. It's 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 cool. I think it's well written and uh, really feels like it's pulled right from the show. There's a very funny last paddle, which I think is unintentionally funny, where there's an investigator comes in and is a betazoid and is like, I'm going to read you guys. You're this. Worf, you're yeah. this. You're this. Yeah. Odo, I can't read you at all. The last paddle is Odo being like, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Say what? Whoa. But made me laugh out loud. I don't think it was supposed to, though. Wolverine number four for Marvel Comics, written by Benjamin Percy and art by Victor uh, Bogdanovich. Uh, this finds Wolverine going to a bar. He's just trying to chill out, get away from Krakoa for a little bit. Guess what? Bunch of people who he destroyed the lives of are actually at that bar and try to destroy him. And then everything goes wrong from there, leading to one of my favorite last panels of the week. Uh, what did you guys think about this issue? We'll start with Pete, Wolverine's number one fan. Oh, this is just great. Um, suck it, Magneto. You're wearing a piss helmet, you fucking dick. 
Uh, this is just... just uh, sorry, can I explain that really quickly? So uh, Wolverine... That's just Pete's catchphrase, <laughs> if I remember correctly. Yeah. Uh, Wolverine borrowed Magneto's helmet and pissed at it, and that's established in the book. So there you go. Woo, that's he's canon. The, he's the best he is at what he does. Yeah. And what he does is piss in other people's hats. Guess what, Lollipop Man? <laughs> Your helmet's next. Oof, that would wreck the some electronics there. Yeah, I bet. You'd be, you'd be um, putting his lollipop helmet in a big bag of rice after Wolverine pees on him. <laughs> Get that pee right out of there. Oh, boy. Uh, yeah, this is uh, amazing art. Some interesting uh, storytelling. I'm very excited to see where this goes. It's just kind of like the classic, you know, Wolverine just wants to kind of be left alone and no one will leave him alone. So... It'll be interesting to see. Uh, it's nice to get Omega Red coming back. So, uh, yeah, I mean, other than the kind of stupid tie-in with fucking Fuck Island, uh, I think this book is great. I did That's appreciate weird. that the cover at least had that designation, a Fuck Island tie-in. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. Uh, he lives on Fuck Island, or near, at least he works there. So He let him works there. Yeah, he lives on Fuck Moon. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, can I just spoil the last paddle? Because I feel like this is yes. the thing where I read this book and I was like, all right, I get it. This is a pretty good Wolverine adventure. It goes to a bar, encounters some people. They want to kill him. I get this. I've read this a million times. This is a well-done version of it, but whatever. But as Pete mentioned, and this is a spoiler for the end of the issue, at the end of the issue, it turns out Omega Red was there the entire time, murders all of those people before they could murder Wolverine. They've put him uh, in some ice and they're going to freeze him under the water. And the final final panel is Omega Red holding Wolverine deep under the icy water, and Omega Red is now working for Dracula, so Dracula is in the background with an army of vampires on the ice, and it's bonkers. Like, that's yeah. the thing I want to read. I cannot it, wait to read that next issue. Next because, issue is going to be bananas. Like, right. oh. Yeah. Um, I agree. I thought this was a fun story. I really like Omega Red as a villain in general. Um, cause Omega Red's very weird, like tentacle, like e pain eating tentacles. Yeah. I believe Omega Red also releases spores, uh, randomly. And yeah, if you're into like, uh, henta porn, yeah. this is your dude. <laughs> <laughs> and who doesn't? Go. Who doesn't, yeah, honestly, yeah. Pete? Uh, got a couple more here before we wrap up. Firefly number 19. Wait, wait. Was Justin done with it? seemed like he was building to something. Uh, no, just okay. a good old My Wolverine. Bad. And you My said uh, you said that you hope this next issue is bananas. And I instantly thought, what if Wolverine had bananas instead of claws? And I thought that was fun. <laughs> oh. He just pops three bananas out of each hand and was Ooh. like, you want to have some fucked up dreams? Eat these, <laughs> eat these bananas. <laughs> Wait, bananas give you fucked up dreams? They do. If you eat a banana before bed, if you want to have some weird dreams. Oh, mm. man, I'm going to try that. Uh, man, and I thought Wolverine couldn't have more appeal. Oh, Firefly number wow. 19 from Boom Studios, written by Greg Pak and illustrated by Lalit Kumar Sharma. This is continuing the storyline where Mal is now a sheriff of a part of the verse. Uh, his old friends are being chased by him. Meanwhile, there is an outlaw who is seemingly fighting Mal. There's a little bit of a twist there that I won't necessarily spoil, though I think you can figure it out if you read the book. Um, oh, yeah, you can figure that shit out early in the book. Very early in the book, but I don't think they're hiding it very much. Uh, nope. It's This is very fun, though. This is a fun issue. Yeah, yeah I think... Oh, I think ahead. we've been loving this uh, series, and this has some big Scarlet Pimpernel vibe to it. Mm, uh, right, good Alex? ref, yes. Of course. I know uh, him well from Daffy Duck, of course. Yes, that's the <laughs> canonical reference I was making. Um, I don't know if you guys have heard of this Greg Pot guy, but he's a hell of a writer, and uh, he's killing it on this Firefly book. It's Firefly, you know kind of missed me for some reason, but I am really loving this comic. I also like the artistic takes on the characters. They're a little cartoony in this issue in particular, but they're super fun, and they capture the vibe of the characters. It makes the book feel very light and fun, uh, which Firefly was sort of supposed to be the grittier alternative to Star Trek 
at least at first. Um, so it's nice to see them pull that out artistically as well as in the writing. Last but not least, let's talk about Decorum number 4 from Image Comics Words by Jonathan Hickman and art by Mike Huddleston. Um, so we talked about with last issue... Wow, wasn't that a straightforward issue of Decorum? We got uh, our uh, courier is being trained as an assassin. Um, Very straightforward issue. Got away from the weirdness that's been peppered through the previous issues. Great news. This was a bonkers Jonathan Hickman episode with crystal people and eggs breaking open and things just happening all over the place in the universe that are very hard to hold on to. Uh, what did you guys think about this book? Uh, I love how you save this book um, for the end, uh, mostly for us to review. It's like eating a full meal, including dessert, and being like, oh, hey, you want to try this fucked up vegetable I found? <laughs> 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 and that's what this is. This is a weird vegetable that looks like broccoli, but it's like a fucking rainbow or something. <laughs> and it's cooked with a sauce that's like, that's not a sauce. That's just what the vegetable looks like. Uh, I, I Pete, don't know. You, I, had, you had got to love this, right? Hit me with uh, your like, opinions. Uh, hey. Hickman, do you want to be in advertising? Like, you're just making symbols that mean shit. Like, what what's going on? Like, I, I know, like, symbols are cool. And just, like, putting different, like, maps of things and symbols together with colors is cool. But, like, you know, there's a lot of pages of that, man. You're, you're eating away at some comic here just so you can do some funky design work. And, you know, it's artistic. Um, the actual art when you get into the book is really great. There's some crazy looking spaceships, some amazing colors. Uh, but I, yeah, I have no fucking idea what's happening. This is very hold on, hard to hold on to this issue. And I, the thing that keeps me going is that these two, and I say this very loosely, storylines are going to hopefully come together at some point in some way that is entirely unclear yet. Uh, but this is like reading a fever dream. And it looks like a fever dream because of the way that Mike Huddleston does the art, switching between different styles throughout the book. It's a gorgeous package. It really um, is. But gorgeous uh, package. Gorgeous package. But this is one that I feel like I do wonder if it's going to read better in the trade when you could have a sense of, oh, okay, here's where the story went at the yeah. end of the day. Because right now, very lost, but very good book anyway. I like this book, um, despite the fact that it's sort of like a jam session where it's just a bunch of ideas on the table and uh, different art styles. It reminds me a lot of a book uh, called Profit, the image uh, came out with, written by Brandon mm-hmm. Graham. It took the Rob Liefeld character and concept and brought it into the far future where it was all this like space odyssey with a bunch of weird characters coming together. You never quite knew what they were doing. There would be a lot of like side stories with like a gloopy alien being like, well, here's where I have sex with this fish or whatever. <laughs> uh, and so I, this reminds me of that in a good way. I liked that Profit book and I like this book. You so you don't you don't mind all the weirdness and the unexplained and the. I welcome the weirdness because it isn't aren't our regular lives just uh, boring? Wow! Um, Not right now, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> don't Not we right want to f- chase a little weirdness in the world? No. I mean, d- despite <laughs> the fact that everything is like stressful, our lives are still oddly boring. Wh- Am I right? No. It's like we're locked. I feel locked crazy into- all the time. But to me, it's like it's just the it's like a uh, hitting your hand on something metal on a cold day where it's like, oh, uh, stuff's happening. But it sort of has that like cold pain to it. Do you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> no. Uh huh. Yeah. <laughs> I don't. Sure. Would you say that this comic is a beautiful package or has a beautiful package? <laughs> well, uh, what? Pete. Well, I'm uh, just trying to echo what Zelb said here. Oh, are you? It's a beautiful package. Yeah. You saying like it has a big dick, Pete? Is that <laughs> No, I'm you said it's a beautiful package and Justin liked this book. And I'm wondering if he would quantify it as saying that it's a beautiful package. Well, I'll tell you what, it, I'm gonna say this right now, and I hope Image Comics uses this as a pull quote for the cover. 
Decorum by Jonathan Hickman has a big fat dick. Wow. <laughs> it's a beautiful penis. If you'd like to support this podcast, patreon.com slash comic book club. Also, why would you go right into that after that? <laughs> you, I would purposely not support us after you did that fucking joke. Don't say that. No, Jesus there is Christ. a level. There is a level on our Patreon where we will tell people they have a big fat dick. That's right. Oh and it's very low. <laughs> <laughs> Surprisingly <laughs> low. It's basically, it's basically free. free. We're giving it away. Patreon and we're going to end this episode, as usual, with our list of <laughs> big, fat dick supporters. <laughs> what is happening? We do a live show every Tuesday night at 7 p.m. to Crowdcast and YouTube. Come hang out and chat with us about comic books <laughs> and literally nothing else. Uh, <laughs> iTunes, Android, Spotify, Stitcher, or the app of your choice to subscribe and listen to the show. ComicBookClubLive.com for this podcast and many more. Until next time, this is The Stack. Peace out. They sit on crappy couches and they